Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start um, a little bit. Good morning, everyone. And hey, it's really good for me to see you. I'm super excited and really happy to have this opportunity to spend some time with you this morning, and to yeah, just chat a bit about about a topic that really intrigues me, and that's human behaviour and interpersonal effectiveness. My name is Laya Sariki. As you can see, I work with individuals and organizations as a coach and organizational consultant. And interacting with people on a personal level is really important for me. So it's been strange these days because I'm used to working with people either in their offices or out in nature. I do a lot of that as well. So in, in very different spaces. But I usually see the people that I'm working with face to face and there's, there's, that, there's somehow that physical contact as well. So I have done the Zoom thing before with yeah, colleagues or clients that I'm working in, working with who are not in the same place and we have to do this, but it was always like a have to. And now through the situation that we're in, I'm being forced and made to really embrace this opportunity of yeah, using using technology in a in a conscious and positive way. So this is the biggest Zoom meeting that I've ever hosted. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's quite exciting. It's an experiment for me as well. And I'd like to ask you all to just yeah bear with me as I find my way through this and be open to experimenting with me on this platform too. Um. Yeah, before we dive into the topic, I'd like to get a feel for who's here and why are you here. I know with so many people it won't be possible to have everyone speak probably, but I'd like to hear some of your voices and just hear your name. Are you here in a private capacity or for work or maybe both? And who or what calls you? to this session and whoever would like to speak, just unmute yourself to speak and then mute yourself again later. We're also recording the session. So um, yeah, it'll be possible for people who weren't able to join now to listen to the recording later on. Who would like to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, it's Penny here. Um, I'm from a little rural place called Salem, um, jokingly one of the witches, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm here in a private and, and, a, and a work capacity. I'm manager of communications and governance at um, the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we are very... Um, interested in this whole this whole area of, of fluency in management and governance and um, especially with regard to diversification and transformation and mm. and so on so i'm very interested to see how this functional fluency can be adapted and developed in in our workspace wonderful thank you so much penny great to have you here who else is here and would like to say something. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Yvonne van der Merwe, um, born and bred Namibian, and I'm back in Cape Town after having spent eight years there. I've been in the field of industrial psychology for uh, around about, um, let's say, or yeah, independent consultant, 30 years plus. Mm. Um, working in the field of assessments and also industrial um, emotional intelligence and yeah I just think um, uh, dealing with chaos uh, meaning that we're dealing with change and that we're dealing with challenges and it really means that we will have to transform and also need to see what we can use to be successful in this process and that's why I'm here today and thank you very much. Mm. Great, thank, thank you. you. And that, that fits spot on. It's great to have you here and a fellow Cape Townian as well. I'm also sitting in Cape Town. But these days it doesn't really matter where we're sitting, does it? <laughs> mm. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Okay, I'm Rihanna Valiana. 
I'm a famous brands franchisee and um, I enjoy uh, having these because you learn so much from everyone else as well. Mm -hmm. And it's always um, very inspirational mm -hmm. seeing what everyone else is going through as well during these difficult times. Yeah, I just think it's a, a great learning platform for all of us. Great, I completely agree and it's great to have you here and I'm looking forward to some discussion. Yes, thank you. Who else? Would anyone else like to introduce themselves? I see a few new people have also arrived. So welcome to those. We're just doing a round of introductions quickly not everyone but whoever wants to say something and with each voice that i hear i get a better feel for who's in the room and feel more connected with you um uh, hi Leo. my name's fiona anderson i'm also yeah. in cape town <laughs> hi <laughs> um yeah so similar to the lady from namibia i've also i'm born and bred cape Townian, but i actually spent 16 years in the uk um, and came back here about two years ago um, and have actually found it very hard coming back even though it's my hometown and I grew up here um, and I've been trying to get my own business off the ground sort of working with entrepreneurs and um, building sort of an online learning platform for entrepreneurs to allow them to put their own content on there um, but also working to help them with investment so investment between businesses that might want to be expanding into the UK because I've got quite a network of, of contacts there but then also trying to encourage businesses from the UK to use our services here in South Africa mm. um, especially in Cape Town on the, in the tech scene as you know we've got a big tech community in Cape Town mm. um, so yeah that you obviously this current time with the with the virus is um, encourage a lot more online um, chats and online conversations. So, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that there's going to be a world of opportunity that's actually going to open up for everyone on the back of this. Yes. I know some people are having a very hard time, but I'm trying to feel, think positively and think that there will be um, some positive things and opportunities that are going to come out of, of our current state. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so thank you so much for the session. I'm really looking forward to it. Great, thank you so much Fiona for that introduction and for also yeah, reminding us of, of starting positive, staying positive, because I think that's also what functional fluency is about. It's about um, being real, assessing reality um, and at the same time finding opportunity in whatever situations we're presented with. Um, and, and that's an exciting exploration and it doesn't mean that it's always easy, things can be difficult but it's also about being with the difficulty and working with it and working our way out of difficulties and yeah, finding, finding new ways of being, doing things, which is exactly what is happening during these times for a lot of people. There are still people who are joining. So just admitting everyone here, would one or two more people like to introduce themselves? Um, hi everyone. I don't know if you can all hear me. Yes. Ah, yeah. So my name is Marvin Tle. Um, I am a data analyst at Chronology, which is based in Rosebank, Johannesburg. So the reason I, you know, joined this session is to be able to just learn more. I think um, working in the tech space you know working as a data analyst it's very hard being a technical person it's so hard to be able to shift your mindset from a technical perspective to be able to interact with people especially when you are based on different projects we find ourselves so consumed in our work and the technology that we forget that there's people around us mm. and how to communicate with people, how to interact with people, because we are so used to only communicating with these machines and technology and software that we forget that there's people around us. So I think um, for me mostly, I joined the session to learn and 
to to grow like i'm very young and i think um there's so much space that i can grow and i have opportunity to grow and while i'm here during this whole pandemic and everything like i'm right in the epicenter of the pandemic so it's very stressful but we have to learn and we have to try and keep ourselves in a positive mindset so that you know after this cuz some at some point south africa will be beat this the world will beat this so why not learn how to come out as a better person with new skills so that when life i don't want i don't want to, i don't know if the right word is resumes mm-hmm. from where we are right now <laughs> then you know you've learned and you've gained new skills and you've become a better person and i think also learning from everybody who's here everybody has a different story you know different ideas different things to share so i think it will be for me it's it's a great learning experience great learning curve and a great way to meet new people so, yeah wonderful thank you so much for introducing yourself and for sharing your thoughts there also about life resuming or not and i think a lot of people feel as if their lives have been shut down at the moment and what i sometimes see as as part of my task is to remind myself and others that actually we're, we're living right now we haven't stopped living and we we are still able to make decisions for ourselves and one of those decisions is to yes go into that reflective space to learn and grow like you said and it seems that everyone who's here and who's joined us this morning is here to do that it seems that the sense that i'm getting for everyone around this room is that you're you're here with a curiosity with an openness and really that willingness to grow in yourselves and and positively contribute to the world now and after the pandemic whatever that may look like mm. so thanks for that and yeah i'll tell you a bit about what functional fluency is actually it is a model of behavior that was developed by dr susanna temple who is an english woman a former school teacher and a professional in transactional analysis and she during her work as a teacher in england was looking for something that would help stressed out educators handle their relationships better their relationships with their with the children or learners that they were teaching the relationships with the parents relationships with the colleagues and yes also their own relationships with themselves and their demands and expectations on themselves because teachers the way she saw them and the way she experienced herself were were very stressed and and out of that stressed state often didn't really think about what they were doing but were on autopilot a lot of the time and when looked at um with with an evaluative eye often not very effective and kept making the same mistakes over and over running into the same problems over and over and Susanna was looking for something that would help them understand what they're actually doing and help them see and regulate their own behavior so that's where it comes from and what has happened over the years is that functional fluency the model that Susanna Temple created has grown out of just the british educational space but into all sorts of different spaces it's still important for schools and and the educational context i think but it's become really really important for leaders in any kind of organization anyone who works with people on a daily basis who needs to lead and manage other people um who needs to interact with people if they're in a caring profession actually any human being can benefit from learning about about functional fluency and in the words of Susanna Temple functional fluency is the natural way that human beings get along together well i'm actually going to start sharing my screen again oh, two more people have come so i'm going to admit them i'll share my screen just to take you into a bit of my presentation and then i'll come out of it again um there we are 
this is always a bit of a, a tricky bit. Yeah. Share. <laughs> okay. And I've got to go to the next page. Okay, there we go. So the natural way that human beings get along well together, it's the use of those positive and flexible ways of responding to each other that help us communicate well. And it's a name for our social responsibility. So really the ability to respond as opposed to reacting automatically. When people become more functionally fluent, they communicate more effectively and they tend to find relationships more satisfying and successful. People learn how to choose responses that help things turn out well, instead of repeating the old automatic reactions that led them into the same difficulties over and over again. And people find that they save a lot of time, energy and stress when they learn to use functional fluency. So it's really about recognizing your own behavioral pattern. Functional fluency is a model that comes from TA and that is for those who don't know what transactional analysis is. It's a school of humanistic psychology which was developed by Eric Byrne in the 1950s in America. It can be used in any field where there's a need to understand individuals relationships and communication. And an underlying assumption of TA is that people are intrinsically okay. Okay in the sense of always doing the best they can with their awareness, knowledge, skills, information and tools that they have and that they have an in inherent ability to grow. Would you agree with this? Absolutely, yes I would. <laughs> Yeah, so I see a few nods and thumbs up and so on. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree with that too. I do the best I can in all areas of my life. And as a human being, I sometimes still get into situations that I'm not so happy about. So I get stuck. And then sometimes I end up looking out at the world through a window through which I can't see myself or other people as okay. I'm finding fault, I'm seeing what's going wrong, just feeling stuck sometimes, right? And, and that can happen, and it can happen especially in situations where, where we're feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Who recognizes this? Definitely. Anyone else human? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of our behavior is habitual. So we fall into these patterns that we've learned and practiced for a long time. So you've probably all heard about those neural pathways that are like, like well-trodden roads or paths in our brain that we've used over and over and over again. And the more we use them, the thicker and more solid they get. So it's easy to use them. So if we're trying to create new ways of behaving, we need to literally rewire our brains to form new neural pathways, but those will be, it will be difficult at first because it will be ways that haven't been trodden before. We might have to cut our way through some bushes or clear away some rubble that's lying in the way. And then we'll have to walk those paths again and again until those become well trodden. And that's how we can then create new behavior. So let's do a little test. Everyone, well, some of you I can see, some I can't see, and fold your arms. Okay, so that was quick and easy. Now you can unfold your arms and then fold your arms again, but in the other direction. Not how you folded them before, but the different way. Uh, okay. So that second one wasn't as quick and easy as the first, right? We had to think about that. And it's just the same when we have to think about new alternative ways of behaving. If the old ones are not leading us to the outcomes that we actually want, we need to become mindful of what's really happening. What about our behavior is working for us 
and what isn't. So with the folding of the arms, it probably doesn't really matter whether you've got your right hand on the top or the left at the bottom and whatever it is, but I just think it's a, it's a nice example. And I've started practicing folding my arms both ways because it's sort of also about balance and, and trying out different things. And it's just a symbol for trying out different ways of, of doing things. So we want to train our ability to respond instead of react automatically. And the functional fluency model is really useful here, providing us with a map or a menu of positive behaviors. I'll show that to you now, building it up step by step as we go along. So I'll share my screen again. Page. So the functional fluency model has three levels. And the first level consists of three basic categories of human social behavior. Can you see the whole page or do you have um, something covering the, the picture? I see on, on my screen something's covered. Okay, now I can see. I hope everyone can see this. So it's on the, on the bottom level here about using energy on our own behalf. So self-expression, where you see that little green man um, yeah, raising his arms. It's about growing up, becoming ourselves, expressing who we are throughout life. That's that first level of human behavior. Then on the second level, it's about, okay, when we've grown up, we need to, we need to survive, right? And surviving is connected with that internal activity of assessing the reality of the situation we're in. So making sense moment by moment of what is happening so that we can decide based on the facts what to do next. And those facts include um, really what's, what's going on outside of us. So it's, it's about seeing what is really going on, computing consequences, logical and rational thinking, but also that internal sense of where, are, where do our emotions come in? What are we feeling in relation to those activities that are happening outside? So it's connecting what's going on outside of us with what's going on inside of us and taking all of that as information upon which we can then make decisions for our next steps. So that was, we've had growing up, we've had surviving, and then the next step is then really about raising the next generation, you could call it. It's that top bit that is called social responsibility. So that's about being in charge. It can be about being in charge for people at work, people at home, and being in charge of ourselves as well too. So this is about using energy on behalf of others, and at the same time remembering that we can only do that if we can also use energy on, on our own behalf looking after ourselves too. So that's the first level with the three basic categories of human social behavior, which is definitely not rocket science. It's, it's what people do and what people have been doing, what humanity has been doing to survive as a species. Then there comes the next step in which in the second level, a bit more detail is shown so you can see again on the right here, um, those three categories, but you can see that the top part, the social responsibility and the bottom part, self-expression, have been split up into two sides. So the center, which is reality assessment, that bit about being alert and reflective, taking into account what's really going on, that remains one element as an internal activity but the other two get split up. So the social responsibility side, the being in charge, gets split up into two sides. On the one side, there's control, which is about guiding and directing people. And the other side is about care, which is about looking after people. And then if we look at self-expression, that again has two sides to us. We can express ourselves in relation with other people, and we can express ourselves just on our own, doing our own thing our own unique way. 
These are the five elements that name what we do with our energy. And I'll stop the screen share here again. Um, we'll pause for a moment and think about an example that you have from your own lives. Think about a time that you handled a tricky situation really well. So there were, you were in a situation that was tricky, that was somehow difficult. It had to do probably with, with you and other people. But yeah, your, it's your example. It's up to you what it was actually about. The main thing is you were effective in the way you handled the situation and the outcomes benefited everyone. And think about in that situation, what pleased you most about your behavior when you look back at it? And how did you use those five elements in the example? If you want to, you can make a pie chart um, thinking about those elements. I can show them again for a minute as well. Um, you, you can put in there how you combined those elements. So how much, how much reality assessment did you have in there? How much of that pie was control? How much was care? How much was relating to other people, maybe in teams or in the family? How much was just expressing your own self, your own unique way? So that's a possibility. Um, everyone just think for a moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split you up into a small group of three to four people. And in those groups, you can then do a bit of sharing for 10 minutes about the situation, what it was about, what you were proud of, and how you used those elements. Is that okay? Okay. So I've got to see now how many groups I better for. Sorry, did someone have a question? Yeah, I'll never share. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to make 24 okay. groups. So there should be about three people in a group. Don't be fine. So, and I will call you back into the plenary in 10 minutes then. Have fun. Not sure how we break up into groups. I break you up. Oh. I'll send you out into groups and I'll call you back and you will then hopefully, if everything works, appear back. <laughs> cool. This is my very first group thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> Just a moment. Um, so I'll do 24 groups and you'll be assigned automatically. So I don't know who will be in which group, but we'll have two to three participants per room so that you have some time to share one on one or well, one on three. <laughs> Okay, goodbye. See you in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so I think everyone's back. Nice to see you all back and I hope we didn't lose anyone on the way. I think some people joined us um, while we were on the, in the breakout rooms. So um, if you missed the first part, just listen in to what everyone says and I'm sure you'll be able to catch up when you get the notes later on. I'm curious. Um, it felt a bit strange having everyone go and I was sort of left here. <laughs> how did how did that go? How did the discussions go? And what what are you taking from that? If just a few people would like to share from their groups. May, may I start? It's, it's yes. Kim. Yes, Kim. Okay. I just felt uh, that it was an honor and a privilege just to spend time with those two amazing women in, in my group and to see what they're doing and how they're coping and, and the courage and the commitment to carry on and to rise above. And oh, I salute my two, um, my two colleagues. Great. So a big appreciation coming up for, yeah, yes. for what your fellow human beings are, are accomplishing. Mm. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Kim. I hear someone speaking, but I don't know if it's related to our call. If it's not, could you mute yourself? 
Okay, who else would like to share from what came out of their groups? Hello. Uh, Hi, Leo. This is Pina speaking. Yes. Pina. Um, unfortunately, we had communication problems. We had tech problems. So okay. we were three in a room and one member of our group, unfortunately, couldn't hear mm. us and she could only hear me. So I kind of, we lost a bit of time. Right. However, Rita was in, in our group and I'm sorry about that, Elmarie. I hope you can hear us now, Elmarie. Um, so um, I actually just led the, the discussion in terms of um, asking about an awkward situation or a challenging situation and Rita volunteered um, her to identify the behaviours that work for her and I like the concept she says that she tries not to play the person mm -hmm. but she plays the ball so mm -hmm. so she doesn't actually in especially in a, an awkward situation she doesn't go personally. Mm -hmm. So she says that it makes the awkwardness less um, less concrete and rather conceptual. So then I asked Rita, how would she communicate in that situation and, and reach some kind of consensus? Mm -hmm. And I love what she said that she suggested that what works for her was nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. And, and she highlighted an example, um, instead of saying, well, you did this and I didn't do that and you promised me X and I got Y. Mm -hmm. She puts the ball back into um, her, her partner's court. And she right. says, look, I didn't, we didn't achieve our objective mm -hmm. or the objective has not been reached. How do you suggest that we achieve the objective? So mm -hmm. she invites participation from mm -hmm. the other person and it just lessens the tension, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it was really great. Thank you, Rita, for sharing that. Unfortunately, I didn't get to my situation, but <laughs> okay. we'll take a lot of learning from one another. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pina, for sharing that. And, and thank you, Rita, for your example. And, and that just shows that listening is a big part of that. And if we're looking at the at the elements of what do we do um, when we're moving throughout life, um, listening would be would be part of the the caring element, I would say, because we can only actually care for people, see what they need, see what they go through when we listen. So listening is a great skill that you've just exhibited here, Pina, and then you've you've communicated what you've heard to the rest of us. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to share from their groups and maybe also with a, a bit of thought if you were able to give to how the elements that I briefly introduced before this exercise played a role in, in that situation that you were moving through, if you got to that. I'm just curious. Um, I, can I? Hi. Yes. Hi, <laughs> Hey everyone, um, came in a little bit on the back end of the um, the webinar, I was dealing with a client call, I'm very sorry about that, but um, I was uh, cordoned off into a group with Robin and Tanya and um, it was nice, we brief introductions, found out that we are all very sort of similar in the way that we see things, um, but I, I spoke to my particular situation and um, by trade I think I deal with a lot of difficult situations on a daily basis as part of my job. I'm, I'm an attorney by trade. I was practicing, I was in practice and now I'm working in a consultative role to SMMEs. And a lot of what I did was with evictions. Ooh, and okay. that's a nice I situation my... that you found. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. It wasn't exactly what I envisaged I'd be doing when I was studying law, but I got out of that. Um, and in those situations, we weren't really talking about individuals who were well off. We were talking about your sort of indigent housing, but you know, the, this was to a point where what minimal rent had to be paid wasn't paid for signif a significant amount of time. And you would be in a situation where you'd be in the courtroom with a magistrate in front of you who is inevitably um, geared towards making sure that the outcome is equitable. And I think in terms of that three-tiered process, and if you start at the bottom with knowing yourself or self-growth, 
I know going into practice, I'm a highly empathetic person. Mm -hmm. So I want it to be the best outcome for everybody. So I'd like you to be able to stay in the house rent free, but I'd also like my clients to be able to pay their bond, you know? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and I think knowing myself and knowing how I have a duty towards my client, I do at the, un at the end of the day and reality checking myself, but also reality reality checking the situation and, and understanding that that natural empathy that I have towards the respondent, um, that does play a role and that plays a role in perhaps allowing your client or the magistrate to see that, you know, there is another side to the story and perhaps if there had been a form of mediation and, and that's really where I love to, to practice my, my, my profession, that if there's a, an avenue for mediation using effective communication and, and understanding and empathy, but reality checked empathy, yeah. um, which is very difficult, is, mm. is I think a key towards getting the most you can out of a settlement um, situation. I, I, an attorney said to me, if one party walks out of a settlement feeling like they've won, it's not a settlement. Mm. So <laughs> if, you know, you just, practice that realistic empathy um, and, and the other two ladies seem to enjoy um, that example and then Tanya also raised the example of disciplining staff mm -hmm. and um, being in the situation where you do happen to know the personal situations of the staff as, as I think it was uh, Rita said you know you know the person mm -hmm. behind that staff member but what's best for the institution might not necessarily play into how well you know the person. Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, that was very long-winded. It's part of my trade. <laughs> I think that's. I think it was great though, and you've you've summarised it really well, and you've you've really shown us how in those tricky situations to handle them well, you're using all five of those elements that I spoke about earlier, because you're doing the taking everything into account, that reality assessment bit, which is central. You're also doing the control bit where you're giving guidance and direction and providing structure and those kind of things. You're doing the care bit. So the, the wanting people to have a house, the being empathetic, but with, I like how you called it realistic empathy. That's, that's yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> I couldn't have put it better. And you're also doing the bit of cooperating, collaborating. So that's the expressing your own self in relationship with other people because you're not doing this removed from yourself from how you were telling the story you're bringing your full self into these situations and you're also doing your own thing your own way because you are probably handling that situation with your clients in a way that no other person on this earth could and and yeah in including how you express yourself and your feelings and your ideas and bringing your creativity in to the picture and all of that. So I think you've, that has summed it up really, really well. And it shows that we use, in the situations where we're, where we're being effective, we're using all five elements. So it's not about which one is the most important and which one is a good one or which one is a bad one. It's about combining the five elements in ways that make sense. So Susanna Temple calls these five elements, the five elements to survive and thrive. So it's about going beyond the surviving to thriving if you use these five elements in a positive way. And that's where judgment comes in. So we were looking at nice situations now in that example, and you discussed the, the situations in which you were effective with your group members. So you're, that may be your typical mix of how you use these elements, but in situations where you're triggered or stressed, your behavior might look different and you might end up not being as effective. So the five elements are the ingredients to our social behavior and we need them all more or less at different times. And we can use them in more or less effective ways. And that's what brings us to the whole model, which I will show you now by sharing my screen again. There we go. So these were the five elements that we looked at. 
and they were still pretty neutral. If we start bringing an evaluation into it, we see that, yes, this middle stays the same. We're looking at how much of the accounting are we doing, how much is necessary. But on the top part, when we're looking at being in charge, guiding, directing, looking after people, for both of these, we look at how well do we do this? Same goes for self-expression, relating to others and doing our own thing our own way. How well do we do that? Because we can do all of these things effectively or ineffectively. This leads us to the nine modes of behaviors, because if all these, um, if the, the guiding and directing and looking after people have two sides and the relate, relating to others and doing your own thing have two sides, then this gets further split up. And that is the menu of behavior that functional fluency gives us. At the heart of that model, you've got the accounting mode. So that internal activity for making sense of what's going on. It's about tuning in, noticing things, realizing things, staying grounded, assessing facts, considering consequences. And for all this, we need a high level of awareness and a high level of logical thinking skills. From being aware, we can then choose how to respond. We can choose structuring mode responses to give support and inspiration. So using these structuring mode responses, we make agreements, we set goals, we say when enough is enough, we stick to clear limits, we offer challenges, and we focus on what is going well. And that's really important on this. We're focusing on the positive, on what's going well, so that we can build on that. We can also choose nurturing mode responses. So that's the looking after people side. We do this for giving kindness and understanding. So this is about being available, giving time and attention to the other person. It's about listening with empathy, about giving acceptance of the person, offering warmth and appreciation, and really attempting to understand. Then, if we look more to the self-expression side, we can also choose cooperative mode responses. So that's for sharing warmth and assertiveness. With that, we can offer friendliness. We can share things with others. We can listen with respect. We can be willing to give and take. We're also able to stand up for ourselves and we can consider the other's point of view. So this cooperative part of behavior is really about being friendly and assertive at the same time. And we can choose spontaneous mode responses to share liveliness and creativity. With that, you can really let your unique energy come through. You can be open about how you feel. You can be willing to have a go. You use your imagination, express your ideas and enjoy playfulness in your very own way. So these are all those yellow, or they're actually supposed to be golden bubbles for those golden keys to effectiveness. Well, we spoke about being human, right? Events that occur can also trigger us to use less effective modes of behavior. And that's the flip side, and in this picture, the purple side to these different elements that we saw. We can choose dominating mode unconsciously. So all the purple stuff usually happens automatically unconsciously. Using dominating mode, we control in a destructive way. We are disempowering through force and focus on the negative. And this undermines self-esteem um, because we throw in criticisms, put downs, threats, warnings, or punishments for mistakes. So very much focusing on what can go wrong, what can they do wrong, and catching them immediately and punishing for it. So that picture of the person with the big stick is, yeah, very symbolic for dominating mode. Sounds horrible, hey? So we may want to rather be seen as nice and, and very, very caring we end up using marshmallowing mode instead. This is about the soft hidden harmfulness of negative care 
or too much attention of the wrong sort, but reacting with undue sympathy, smothering, overindulgence. So giving help where help is actually not helpful or not needed. So the, the difference between needs and wants are important here. When you're looking at nurturing, you're really catering to needs that you've recognized. In marshmallowing mode, what we do is we're confusing needs and wants and just giving, 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 where it's actually not helpful. And often people end up not being grateful, but rather upset with us and not growing. We may also use compliant resistant mode. So that's moving down there, it's the flip side of the cooperative. We may use compliant resistant mode in relating to other people, reacting either by giving in, um, saying yes for the sake of saying yes, not wanting to rock the boat, using lots of sorries to appease people, or on the other hand, we may react by resisting with aggression or passivity. And the two are actually quite similar because the one is about saying yes for the sake of saying yes. The other is about saying no for the sake of saying no. But neither takes into account what is really going on and, and what we can really contribute to the situation. We're not thinking and we're not really bringing ourselves into the picture. And then self-expression still, but the doing my own thing side, we may use immature mode to express ourselves. So I said it's about freely expressing your feelings. Well, that can look like all sorts of things. It can look like throwing, throwing things around because you're having a tantrum, because you're feeling really, really angry. It's free self-expression, right? Well, it is, but it's a very... Um, ineffective way of expressing yourself. Immature mode is about reacting childishly on impulse in a self-centered way without thought for the consequences. And yeah, those are, those are the nine modes of behavior that Susanna Temple identified and which make up the functional fluency model. So our menu for behavior, which when we see it, recognize it, we can firstly observe ourselves. How are we actually moving through this model? When do we use what? And we can use it to make our choices to bring us consciously back into accounting mode and, and look at, oh, what do, I, what do I usually do automatically if that doesn't work so well? Here's a menu, what could I do instead? And using it in that way has been very helpful for, for me and for lots of my clients as well. So having seen that, I'd be interested in hearing from some of you what, um, what are possible triggers, because we all want to be using those golden modes all the time, right? But we don't. We sometimes go into the purple and into the ineffective. What could trigger you on a not so good day? in using any of the ineffective modes and anyone who like wants to pop just pop uh, again sorry i'm a talkative person <laughs> <Go for it. laughs> my mom's actually my mom's actually on this group and she can attest to this um it seems insignificant but if i don't maintain a, a regular eating schedule mm -hmm. if i get hangry and then i receive what I perceive to be non-constructive criticism. <laughs> and um, it's coming, it's, it is coming from a good place, but I, I'm not employing that reality check effectively. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, well, this person just thinks I'm useless, so screw you. Mm -hmm. And obviously, mm -hmm. most of the time it's not coupled with, it's coupled with not eating properly. So I'm mm -hmm. very grumpy. Okay. And then I become impatient and selfish. And I'll be honest, I'll stick my hand up quite egocentric as well, um, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to a piece of work or a piece of something that I have done that isn't mm -hmm. met with, you know, the degree of, you know, I, I, I don't know how to put it, but the degree of not praise, but like, well done, yay, appreciation, mm -hmm. I think it yes. is. If yeah. I'm not met with the degree of appreciation that in my estimate, and this is all very subjective, mm -hmm. um, measures to the amount of work that I think I've put in, that for me is a trigger and I tend yeah. to 
I'm so involved in what other people think, I tend to almost shut down a little bit and then I've got to mm. build it up back up and say, look, this is not a rational reaction at all. So what, what is your automatic reaction when you're feeling all of this and this is happening? What do you do? I go into a quiet room and I cry. <laughs> I mean, okay. it's, uh -huh. I'll, uh, you know, I, I don't, and I, I'm quite grateful for this, but my immediate go-to isn't conflict. Okay. Uh -huh. So I won't pick a fight, but another, I think, opportunity for growth that I have is that I will immediately internalize the criticism. Right. Okay. Um, and, and I internalize, and um, my fiance always says to me, my emotions and my rational thought are very tied up. Mm. Um, and it will have, it will be an emotional almost reaction by myself. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of instances, particularly when I was younger and starting out in practice, it would just almost derail me for the rest of the day. It would be that, that idea that somebody is criticizing me personally. Yes. And that, that gets you into a very ineffective space because you're not able to function for the rest of the day. So yes, yes. question. How do you feel the beginning of this? Because you've described your pattern very nicely. You know what happens. You know yourself. And it keeps happening again. Where, where do you feel it first? What's the first sign that this pattern is starting? It's generally for myself. It's, a, it's almost like a frustrated lump in my throat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you feel it so right I about here. Feel, yeah. It, you almost if you, you feel almost choked. Mm -hmm. Not physically but by the emotion and I know particularly in my in my field there you can't be highly emotional all the time you, yeah. you just can't it makes you completely ineffective mm -hmm. um, and then the frustration comes with mm -hmm. myself for reacting emotionally yeah. and that lump gets bigger to the point where it's almost like it sounds very juvenile but the quivering bottom lip and then yeah. I have to go to my office Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you already said you have to go to your office. And it, and it sounds like you're, you're judging yourself for this. You can feel it and oh, it's starting and you're trying to get away from it. But the trying to get away from it is making it worse. So an experiment that I can offer to you is to just stay aware with being with that lump in your fr throat, feeling it there and engaging with it almost like, a, oh, hello, it's you. Okay, you, when you come, usually this is what I do. This is what I go to. No, it's not effective. What is the sign? It's a sign for, okay, there are emotions there. What is the information behind those emotions? What else can you do with them? And maybe even look at a, look at a printout of the model and, okay, this, this is where I'm going. It's not effective. What else could I do instead? And just do it playfully. You can play with alternatives. If normally you go into your office, um, well, maybe going into your office is not so bad, but staying there and being ineffective for the whole day might be it. So maybe taking a few breaths in that office, seeing what happens with the lump, when does it get smaller, um, and making a plan for what you could do next, and seeing when it feels better is an idea. And each person has their own their own roots through this, but it usually starts with identifying first the trigger, and then the, the feeling in the body, the place where it begins in the body that tells you now it's the beginning of the pattern. And you can actually stop it earlier and doesn't have to go on for as long as it usually does. Try it out. Thanks for the example. Anyone else have an example to share of, of what could be a typical trigger for you? Into the ineffective. Looks like everyone's uh, thinking. Ah, Fiona. Yes, um, I think I I'd, I'd, would, yes, I'd really just like to thank Christy also for being so open and honest. And I mm. think this is kind of a forum that we can be. So it's kind of prompted me to be as well because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm single and I live on my own and I'm finding this time quite hard, but mm. um, I live a lot in my head mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm always, I end up getting myself similar to what Christy was saying into kind of downward spirals where I, I uh, you know, I, I, I doubt my own ability a lot mm -hmm. and my own kind of 
self-worth and and it's only then when you kind of speak to other people or you know other people will kind of almost say but why are you feeling like that because you come across as being confident and mm -hmm. you know quite sort of you know assured of what i'm doing and but deep inside i don't feel like that at all and a lot of the time i get incredibly like what christy was saying very anxious to a point mm -hmm. where i'm almost in that if you think about fight flight or freeze mm -hmm. i'm almost in that freeze mode because mm -hmm. i i just can't get past the anxiety or this lack of kind of self-confidence feeling deep down inside um and then i just get very frustrated with myself and very mm -hmm. um that, that then gets me into even more of a downward spiral because mm -hmm. i end up kind of feeling frustrated with myself and you know even and and very kind of yeah, yeah as, as I say, that I suppose I get more into a downward spiral because I can't get past that feeling to then show my best side and, and show the, the confident bit. So, and I know what you were talking about, the neural pathways thing. I know that it all comes back to that a lot mm -hmm. with me. It's it's just old habits that I fall back into that yeah. um, try, try consciously not to do, but because of mm -hmm. the anxiety that I'm feeling, I often can't mm -hmm. get past that. Mm -hmm. And then I feel that I've let people down and I'm, you know, I'm not, especially in a professional capacity, I'm not giving of my best self. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Fiona, and for being so open and honest as well. And I think a lot of us, um, as professionals who work with other people and who work on personal growth, our own and others, we tend to get very self-critical and and think we have to have it all right before we can help other people but actually a teacher once told me that people who do growth work have issues and it's because we're learning to work through our own stuff um, that makes us able to be empathetic and nurturing to others and help them through their stuff but then we also must remember to be empathetic and nurturing with ourselves too so having those human reactions is completely okay just as a reminder and the anxiety bit that you mentioned fiona is very very typical for a lot of us that anxiety starts us off with those purple mode behaviors it a lot of people when they get anxious so anxiety usually is, is coupled with the compliant resistant bit that we're either not wanting to rock the boat or going into this rebellious thing because we want the anxiety to go away. And then sometimes True. we jump into the dominant because we want to seem strong or we go into the marshmallowing because it's also somehow about being better than others. All those ineffective ways of behaving can come or can start with anxiety as a trigger. And it's because anxiety is such an uncomfortable emotion that many of us want to get away from and and the more we want to get away from it the bigger and bigger it gets so sometimes i find it's really helpful to let the anxiety be and and also engage with that to see oh it's the anxiety could there be a message what is really scary here what is what is linked with something from the past that this is reminding me of and what is actually happening here and now and i see that rena raised her hand rena what would you like to say There's a hand raised here. No, I, I, I agree and, and uh, put on my video, sorry. Ah. <laughs> and uh, I think I, I respond when I'm feeling undermined and when I'm, um, when my self-confidence is, 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 I respond badly. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's something we've got to check ourselves um, all the time. And I think it's, it's something that I felt was one of the most important things to give my children is that mm. sense, of, that deep sense of self, that sense of self in your gut yeah. that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I got given a message this morning which said, never think and speak about third person and never care what the third person thinks and speaks about you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so actually, when I get into those situations, 
and, and of course it's, it, it's a gut response. I, I breathe deeply and, and, and actually deal with it in that way. Mm -hmm. As I say, I mean, for all those with young children and for all those teachers, the most important thing to give to people is a reflection that you're good enough. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for that, Rena, and also for reminding us of the breathing. Because especially if we're anxious, um, often we stop breathing through that anxiety. And when we stop breathing, we don't have that oxygen flow to the brain and we can't actually think anymore. So it becomes more and more difficult to do that accounting, that reality assessment that we actually need to do. So it's almost like that gets us into a vicious cycle if we're not breathing and not connected with our own body. So connecting with your body and breathing can be the solution to so many of those difficulties and can bring us back into that accounting space in functional fluency terms. I realize that time is moving on and we're coming towards the end of the session. Um, definitely not your end of, of your reflective paths that we're all on. And if you found this useful, you can continue with working with functional fluency in, in several ways going forward. You can use the model as a framework for yourself as you observe your own behavior patterns and their effectiveness. And you can feel your way through and experiment sometimes just with doing things differently. And your outcomes might be better, they might be worse. Just be open to what happens and be gentle with yourselves when you experiment. What you can also do, if for anyone who would like to, is you can fill in an online questionnaire to get your own personal TIF profile. So TIF stands for Temple Index of Functional Fluency. And that then shows a snapshot of your behavior at this point in time. It's not a personality model. It's really, this is a behavioral model that just looks at what forms of behavior are presenting for a person at a particular point in time and how are the effective and the ineffective behaviors distributed. And that is then a basis for a two hour feedback discussion, feedback session with a certified TIF provider. We have a few TIF providers in South Africa and hoping, hoping to be getting more of them because I find this model so useful. So you can work with it in that way. I also sometimes work with it in organizations with teams where each team member then does their TIF profile and that can be aggregated into a team TIF profile so that the team together can look at, hmm, what's our behavioral profile together? How is that helping us move towards our goals? And how is that hindering it? So that that then again is a basis for a discussion in a team of people who want to commit to, well, keeping things up, doing things differently and seeing, seeing what they want to keep and want to change. So different ways of continuing the work with that. And when you get the presentation, there'll be my contact details on there. If anyone has, has questions or comments, you're very welcome to get in touch with me. But before we close, I'd like to hear a few closing comments from all of you guys as well. Well, at least some of you guys, um, for how this was for you and what you're taking with you from this. If there was a, yeah, a key insight, a message, whatever it may be for you. Leo, it's Kim here. Yes, Kim. I'm just checking that you will share your slides with us. Yes, I will. I've already sent them to Lovely. Taz and she can send them to everyone else. Fantastic. Thank you. So again, um, I, um, my, one of my key takeaways is to remember what I do right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, one of my takeaways is that this session has given me something important to do during the lockdown. Wonderful. I'm going to spend a lot of time reflecting and identifying my own ineffective and effective ways and get to understand the triggers and so that after the lockdown, I'm more ready, um, you know, with new behaviors that I would want to practice. 
That sounds great. And as you practice them, remember also to be gentle with yourself. You may get things right. Once in a while, we slip back and go back into the ineffective and it's all okay. We're growing. Definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, my takeaway from this, everybody, is thank you so much for everybody's input and contribution. Much appreciated. And it's just the importance, again, I was reminded of the importance of being more self-aware. Because without self-awareness, one can't regulate one's own behaviors. True. You know, um, and the feedback notwithstanding. But, but that I was once again reminded, and also reminded about um, validation, just from Christy has, has um, triggered some other thoughts in that area is, uh, and in relation to IQ and EQ, and often I think how we function in the world is we validate us, or the world validates and um, acknowledges us in terms of IQ. So it's so important for us to succeed and achieve all the material objections or social norms, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, which are very much based on an IQ uh, function. Yes. And yet, then we lose sight of the EQ. So it's also okay to be in touch with what's happening internally and emotion, emotional quotient. Yes, which can be worked upon and raised, certainly. Um, so that is really, and also from TA, if I remember correctly, Eric Byrne says, actually, I'm okay. Yes, yes. It's, it's about yes, you're okay, I'm okay. Yes. And mm -hmm. we're talking about EQ here, we're not talking about IQ. Mm -hmm. So it's also okay. So Christy also, or I think it was Fiona as well, it's okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to feel what we're feeling, mm -hmm. acknowledge it, and then work with it. So exactly. thank you very much. Thank you for for the, all this time of reflection and sharing. Thank you, Pina, for everything that you brought and shared. Thanks. Um, Leo, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and everybody for all your insights. I think what I'm taking away today is to give myself permission to play mm. because I think the world responds really well to playfulness. And certainly in this time of uncertainty, anxiety, and uh, probably quite high levels of struggle for a lot of people, I think that playfulness to become more effective um, will help a lot. Thanks yes, very much. Definitely. Thank you, Carol. Can I come in again? It's also yes. cutting grooves in what you do. Mm -hmm. you as, you know, even your roots that you mm -hmm. take every day, they're mm -hmm. like, uh, I say my route to the highway is my driveway, you know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it's cutting new grooves into your personality, like just folding your arms differently. Yeah, lovely. Cutting new grooves, yes. And we can all practice doing that during lockdown and after. Who knows what's ahead of us? We, it's a time of great uncertainty and we don't know. But we can also see it as, as mystery and, and meet it with, with curiosity and openness and that willingness to experiment, which we've played with a bit today. I see there are, there are lots of comments on the chat as well. I'll read those through also and I'll, I'll keep them all. I'm happy to share them all so everything's being saved. I'll share the recording. I think we'll need to um, do a bit of cutting with the recording because there was the there were the breakaway sessions in between. So we'll have to see that it all fits together and we don't have blank bits in between. But I will share that with the Symphonia group when that's done and you will all you'll all get access to it. So thank you again um, to everyone who was here for being here fully and participating and contributing. And thank you, Kim and everyone else at Symphonia for, well, giving us this platform and making it possible for us all to meet during this special time. Thanks so what much. What a pleasure, Leo. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for participating. And 
Yeah, this was this was a lot to think about. Thank you. It's soul food. All yeah. soul food. Thank you. <laughs> Take your time thinking about it. It may mm. it may need some time to digest and just observe yourselves over the next few days, weeks. Sometimes it's interesting how weeks later something all of a sudden pops up and it's like, yes. oh, that's what this was about. Yes. Mm. Okay, so I wish you all well. Have a lovely day and and week and a really blessed time ahead. Thank and then you. I'll, Thank I will you. close the meeting. Bye everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Leah and Lyle. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go well. Bye. Stay Thank safe. you very much. Thank you. Bye.